there's not a day, not a single day that doesn't go by on the interstate that we don't put somebody in jail for narcotics. We're finding mainly marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine are the three main drugs we find. We find all of it. But those are the three main drugs, and out of all of those, it'll probably be marijuana. This is what the task force does every day. A total of a thousand drug cases last year, 600 already on the books for this year. The appearance of a new drug is not a good sign. It just adds to the organized drug traffic. My life was completely different when I was a police officer. I spent the first 10 years of my life in California because my dad was in the military. My dad moved myself and my brothers to Texas where I trained coon dogs, I trained cow dogs, I trained obedience dogs, and then later I went to the Kilgore Police Academy at the age of 21 and graduated with my peace officer's license. Fresh out of the police academy, 21 years old, like most 21 year olds, they haven't experienced certain tragedies in life, they haven't experienced certain triumphs in life, and uh, that's how I was when I was 20 years old. I was gung-ho, high energy, totally believed in what I was doing, but I was blinded in wisdom because of my lack of experiences in life. I spent four years as a police officer before being hired by the Permian Basin Drug Task Force. In those four years, I trained my own narcotic detector dog when the Permian Basin Drug Task Force called me for an interview. I drove all the way to West Texas, which felt like halfway around the world to me. I had my dog in back of the truck and when I arrived my dog bounced out with a rope, not a leash, and I had a minnow bucket that I used as a watering pail and my supervisors were thinking, oh my gosh, who is this country boy with a rope, a dog, and a minnow pail? And after hiding marijuana and showing how well my dog did, it kind of surprised them and that led to them hiring me. It wasn't long and I began to find loads and loads and loads of drugs. I couldn't believe working with the Border Patrol and the FBI and the ATF and the DEA, we'd get close to the border and we'd get on the interstates and we'd run search warrants and we would work undercover and it just never quit. It was constant. And later with that type of training, I switched and reversed and started seizing money and then I couldn't believe the cash that was leaving our country going into uh, Mexico from the drug traffickers. So I soon realized no matter how much I seized or how many arrests I made, I was not catching a fraction of what was coming through the border. So I was sent to schools all over Texas that were taught by the DEA, the U.S. government. In these classes, I was taught and trained that marijuana was a demon type drug. I really believed that marijuana was harmful and the people using the marijuana and the people smuggling the marijuana were just pieces of trash. And that was about the time DEA was launching uh, the cannabis eradication program where they were flying over and spotting marijuana fields from the air and uh, then sending ground troops in to eradicate those. In fact, I'm trained to fly in the air and spot marijuana fields. You know, I noticed the people that I was busting for marijuana use in particular were really good people. They never acted out. They never got violent. They were always cooperative in comparison to people I arrested for being drunk. You know, they would fight and scream and act crazy. And I started putting two and two together. The government's telling me marijuana is a demon weed. I'm arresting all these people for marijuana that are nonviolent, including getting in raid gear with 10 other grown men and guns, more guns than we would ever need, crashing into these homes, dragging the kids away, screaming with the parents screaming. Everybody in tears. We're sending the kids to Department of Human Services. We're sending the parents to jail over marijuana. Well, I knew some of these people, and I knew they weren't gangsters. I knew they were nonviolent people. 
And then later on, I experimented with marijuana myself and then be began doing a lot of research. I learned marijuana uh, was safe, that it, you cannot overdose on marijuana. I learned that there were a lot less traffic fatalities on marijuana than there was alcohol. I just learned that the harms I was taught by the government were a total lie and they were false. And that's the moment when I started telling myself, this is not right. I'm believing my teachers without researching the facts for myself. Once I got the true evidence, then my conscience kicked in. The humanity in me, the compassion that said, oh my God, what the f*** am I doing busting into these homes, ruining lives and ruining families? And then I remembered uh, uh, what I had read, Jimmy Carter's statement, that when the legal side effects of a substance cause more harm to the person than the side effects of the substance itself, we have an injustice. That totally made sense with me because I'm a logical, reasonable person. And I have to say, that was a big, that was a big turning point for me. I was making so many arrests in Gladewater that the local drug task force was basically kicked out of Gladewater and they lost their funding because of a decision the city manager made. She thought, if Barry's seizing all these drugs, why do we need to keep paying a task force? So task force is gone. I made a huge drug arrest that uh, brought in a lot of money and three what they called bad guys at the time to jail and the DEA had been trying to catch these three bad guys for a long time. So because the local task force had to leave, DEA being jealous of me, it caused a lot of political pressure. When you put on top of that, I arrested a city councilman for a bag of marijuana and a pistol and the mayor's son for methamphetamine. It was just such political pressure. At the same time, I started realizing this injustice that I was part of, so I quit law enforcement and began building companies and selling them. After leaving law enforcement in the next 10 year span, I went through two divorces and was arrested five times. Each time I was arrested, I either got a not guilty or it was dismissed. I truly did not deserve to be arrested for any of these offenses. So here I am, ex-narcotics officer, put hundreds of people in jail, responsible for thousands of people being in jail in joint operations, and now I'm being put in jail when I shouldn't be, and I started seeing both sides of the coin. I know what it's like to have police raid your house. I personally was raided on a civil matter, not a criminal matter, where they were coming into the house to take my two daughters. My two daughters put up resistance to the point the police put bruises on them. My daughters were screaming, please help, please help, please help. There was nothing we could do. They decided the kids were not going to go, so they just left the house. Just like those eight, nine, and ten-year-old kids that I busted into their home ten years ago, they still remember that and it still bothers them. The parents seeing their kids drug away, that hasn't left. They might be out of jail now, they might not be. But that trauma of having police enter your home uninvited puts a permanent wound, a permanent scar into the spirit and the soul of a human being. It's serious and it's sad. Now I'm 37 years old. I sold all of my companies, including a successful cage fight company that we started where we did uh, mixed martial arts shows all over the South. I needed another project to work on, but the next project I wanted it to really help people. I put two and two together with my experience as a police officer and then the last 10 years, the five arrests I've had, it got topped off when they put me in jail for not returning Jeepers Creepers 1 and Jeepers Creepers 2 on time to a video store. I was arrested for theft. Later the charges were dropped and I got my money back, but I still spent time 
in a jail with 20 other inmates because I didn't return DVDs. It was clear to me that our Fourth Amendment rights of unreasonable search and seizure or search and arrest were so eroded and the courts were doing nothing to protect my rights against these unreasonable search and seizures that I decided to do something about it by putting together a DVD full of information that nobody else wants to tell to protect ourselves from these unreasonable and crazy police arrests. The response has been tremendous. Sales went through the roof when this DVD hit the world news media. I have not stopped doing interviews. I have a national voice now to speak out and say what thousands of Americans in our prisons want to say but can't say. It is clear to me and it is becoming more and more clear to everybody including law enforcement that the punishments of marijuana do not fit the crime. For instance in my state if somebody's caught with as much as a marijuana roach in their house upon conviction they lose their driver's license for an entire year. Yet, in the same state, somebody can be convicted of child molestation, receive probation, and they never lose their driver's license. I also learned, according to the Center for Disease Control, that 18 million Americans smoke marijuana every day, and 42% of Americans from the age 12 to infinity have tried marijuana at least once. So that's almost half of the U.S. population. I don't believe that nearly half of the American populace belong behind bars. It's ludicrous, it's crazy, it's not right.